Hi again, continuing on in Mark's Gospel. A question to begin with though, what kind of books do you like to read? For me, I love reading a well-written biography. Um, I'm a, a lover of history and reading a biography is one way for me to enjoy history. And one biography I've read recently that I really enjoyed was this one about Winston Churchill, written by a guy called Sebastian Hafner, who's actually ironically, a German writing a biography about Winston Churchill. I find Winston Churchill to be an absolutely fascinating historical character. You may not know this, but before World War II, Winston Churchill spent about a decade in the political wilderness. He'd played both sides of politics and both sides of politics were absolutely sick of him. So he spent the 1930s writing books and and generally trying to get back into, into public life. Uh, but the establishment didn't want anything to do with him. But then with the rise of Nazi Germany and with the beginning of World War II, that became Winston Churchill's finest hour. The story goes that when World War II began, Neville Chamberlain, who was the British Prime Minister at the time, was in the cabinet meeting where they decided that they were going to go to war and, and fight the Nazis. And when this decision was made, Chamberlain put his head on the table like this. And then when he raised it again, people say that he was as white as a ghost because he didn't want to go to war. In fact, very few people in Britain wanted to go to war because they could remember World War I. They didn't want to go down that path again, which is why Neville Chamberlain attempted to appease Hitler. Um, we look back on that now, we think, what a, what a foolish attempt that was. But at the time, it seemed like a sensible approach, because war was not something that people wanted. Churchill, on the other hand, he knew that the only way to beat Hitler was to have a fight. He was one of the very few people in Britain to think that way. And so, after Chamberlain, power came to, to rest in Churchill's hands, and the rest, as they say, is history. In fact, uh, Hafner suggests that the reason Churchill was so important to the British effort was that it was a case of it takes one to know one. Uh, Hafner suggests that perhaps Churchill was a little bit like Hitler in that he was very aggressive, um, willing to have a fight, very ambitious, and so he knew what it was that he was up against and he knew what was needed. What was needed was a battle. So Churchill was the man for the hour. Now what we have here in Mark chapter 5 is a scene from perhaps the greatest, well not perhaps, a scene from the greatest battle of all. The battle between God and the spiritual forces of evil. God in the person of Jesus of Nazareth doing battle against this whole array of demons who have inflicted this poor individual. A scene we have in Mark chapter 5, which can prepare us for the spiritual battle that lies before each one of us. Because when we read through the rest of the Bible, we see that the devil is real and the battle is something we each will need to face in different ways and at different times. Um, you know, Paul talks about the devil being able to grab a foothold in, in our lives. And, and Peter talks about the devil being like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Even in the prayer that we, we utter every week, the Lord's Prayer, what do we pray? Deliver us from evil. Or as some versions have it, deliver us from the evil one. By the scriptures we read and by the prayers that we pray, we can see and we admit that the spiritual battle is still one in which we, well, we need to pay attention to it and we need to be engaged in it. And so a passage like this, Mark chapter 5, can help us to prepare to do battle, prepare to engage the enemy. Uh, this passage helps us to be a little bit like Churchill and also to choose our Churchill. A little bit like Churchill in that this passage can teach us to not be naive about the enemy, it can inform us about what the enemy is like, to see the enemy for who he really is. But this passage can also help us to choose our Churchill, to choose our champion, to choose our leader who is up for the fight, who can do battle, a leader that we can fall in behind. A little bit like Churchill, 
enabling us to choose our ch Churchill. That's what this passage, passage can do. I see the passage falling into, into three sections. Verses 1 to 5 describes the enemy. In particular, it describes the enemy's purpose. Uh, verses 6 through to 13 describes the battle. And then verses 14 through to 20 describe the aftermath of the battle. And with every battle in the aftermath, there are decisions that need to be made. And that's certainly true of this battle that we have here in Mark chapter 5. And so first of all, let's have a look at the enemy. What is it that this chapter teaches us about this spiritual enemy that we're doing battle against? Well, let's have a read. Mark chapter 5 verse 1. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain, for he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. One of the first things we learn about the enemy in these verses uh, comes from the setting. You notice three times we're told that this poor, afflicted man is in the tombs or among the tombs. Verse 2, man with an impure spirit came from the tombs. Verse 3, the man lived in the tombs. Verse 5, night and day among the tombs. This is an enemy who surrounds himself with death. This enemy takes his captives to the grave. I wonder if you can imagine the scene. Uh, it's a frightening scene of, of a, a terrorised man uh, howling on the hills day and night. Perhaps you can imagine him standing there on a hill silhouetted with a big moon behind him. Maybe I'm being a bit dramatic, but maybe not. And then as he howls out, he bends down and cuts himself with a stone. It's a terrible scene. And in this day and age... The idea of cutting yourself with a sharp implement, and unfortunately many of us are becoming familiar with this again as we observe some of our young people go through the terrible mental trauma that leads to this kind of self-mutilation. I'm not saying that when someone cuts themselves it's necessarily demonic, but it is a sign that something is wrong, isn't it? It is a sign that someone needs help. And certainly this is the case here with this man. It, it, this cutting is demonic and he needs help. He needs healing. Uh, he's being led down into the depths of death. And, and that, that is the purpose of this demonic infliction, to lead him to the grave. So if that's the purpose of this demonic action, to, to bring death, to snuff out life. Uh, what is the method that's being used? Well, the method here is demonic possession, and that in itself raises a lot of questions for us, doesn't it? Um, is this something we should expect to see in our society today? Um, is, is, this, is this real, or, or do we, can we explain it with, with modern psychiatric categories? Uh, well, I think it is real. Um, the Bible speaks of it, the New Testament speaks of it as a, as a very real type of affliction. But the Bible also suggests that it's not a, a universal experience. I mean, in the Old Testament, I, think of, I, I can only think of only one real example of a demonic possession. This is with King Saul where an evil spirit afflicts him. Um, and then even in the New Testament, in, in the, the later letters that we find in the New Testament, demonic possession isn't really mentioned that much. And this has led some scholars to suggest that what we see here in the Gospels and also in the book of Acts is a, a moment in history where Satan and his minions have decided to agitate in a very particular way against Jesus and his ministry and against the establishment of the early church. It's a period of heightened demonic activity. And certainly our experience in the modern age is that this kind of demonic activity comes at certain times and in certain places, but it's not universal. 
This doesn't mean that the the devil is not active in other ways, though. Um, Paul teaches us that false doctrines coming through false teachers, uh, that is a type of demonic activity. So demons can be active through the smooth tones of a false teacher. And the, the idea there is to lead people away from God's teaching. And what happens when you're led away from God's teaching and you allow sin to reign in your life? Well, all of a sudden, the same purpose comes into view, doesn't it? We're led to death. Now, that's always Satan's purpose, be it through demonic possession, as we see here in Mark chapter 5, or through the teachings of, of false teachers. In fact, the first recorded instance of demonic activity in the Bible, the serpent in the garden with Adam and Eve, now, that's an example of moving people away from God's teaching, isn't it? Now, the serpent doesn't possess Eve, but the serpent does try and nudge Eve away from God's word to other ideas. And what is the result? Well, the result is death, physical death, but also our sins lead us to spiritual death as we find ourselves subject to God's judgment. And so when it comes to demonic activity, I think the methods differ, but the purpose is always the same. The purpose is to lead men and women to death. And so the question now is, well, how are we going to challenge this purpose, this, this evil satanic purpose? Or rather, who is going to challenge this evil satanic purpose? Well, verses 6 through to 13 describe the battle. Verse 6, when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and he fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. There are a number of things we can observe in this contest. Um, first of all, I guess, is to say that it's really no contest. We witness the mastery and power of Jesus over these many demons. Uh, these many demons are no match for the one person, the God-man, Jesus of Nazareth. No match for him. Uh, his power is absolute in this situation. We also notice the desire of the demons to maintain what influence they can. They don't want to leave the area, even though they know the game is up. They're, they're, still, they're, they're still vying to have some kind of influence over, over this person maybe it may be certainly over the area when jesus asked the name a very interesting response is given we're not given a name we're given a number legion and a legion of roman soldiers was probably about four thousand to six thousand uh, men in size and that just gives you an idea of the terrible suffering that this individual would have been subject to Imagine having 4,000 to 6,000 demons within you, wreaking havoc with your mind, wreaking havoc with your body. Terrible suffering that this man was experiencing. But no match for Jesus. Uh, verses 11 to 13. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Uh, the large size of the herd here is significant. Uh, 2,000 pigs, that, that's a large herd. And again, it gives us an idea of just how many demons we're dealing with in this scene. At least 2,000. And so... It gives us an idea of the suffering of the man, but it also gives us an idea of the value of the man. A herd of 2,000 pigs would have cost a lot of money. They would have made a lot of money. But such is the value of this one individual that Jesus is willing to, to waste this herd of pigs uh, because he sees so much value in this man. Um, I've heard it said that perhaps a modern-day equivalent would be if there was a demon-possessed man down at Circular Quay and if Jesus were to expel the demons from him, 
Uh, perhaps they would rush into a, a large skyscraper, empty of people, of course, and then cause that skyscraper to crash into the water. As such is the financial destruction that uh, these demons um, wreck on the, the herd of pigs. It's just a little moment that tells us that human beings are incredibly valu valuable. Um, the Bible is very positive towards business, very positive towards us being industrious, very positive towards industry, not opposed to us making a dollar or two. But with the creation of wealth comes certain conditions, the condition for us to be generous and the condition for us to always recognise the value of other human beings. Human lives are worthy of salvation, no matter how wretched they may appear. Even if that salvation is costly, and the cost may be a herd of pigs, or it may be the death of a Messiah on a cross. But that cost is worth it, because we are worth it. Um, some people have said that perhaps the state of this man mirrors the state of the crucified Jesus. This man cries out on a hilltop, Jesus cries out on the hill of Calvary. This man uh, is, is cut with stones, Jesus had his flesh cut with the crown of thorns, with the, the whip of the Roman soldiers, um, his flesh cut with the nails on a cross. Uh, this man lived among the tombs, Jesus was placed in a tomb. And the suggestion is that at the end of Mark, we see Jesus taking the place of people who have been entrapped by evil, taking the place of this man and other men like him, taking the place of us who have our own battles with evil in order to free us from the trap of evil. And the way that freedom comes about is if the devil's method is to lead us to death by leading us to sin, then the forgiveness of sins enabled by the cross releases us from that grasp that the devil has on us. Our sins need not lead us into God's judgment, but rather can be forgiven. And so the devil will not have his way with us. That is the ultimate victory that Jesus has over the forces of evil. What we see here in Mark chapter 5 is just a skirmish at the beginning. But the ultimate victory would come at the end of Mark's gospel with Jesus' death on the cross. And so, friends, that's the battle, uh, decisive in the end, with Jesus victorious. And after the battle, of course, there come decisions. One decision after the battle is, well... Who do you side with? Do you side with the victor or do you maintain some, some sense of, of resistance against him who is victorious? Well, we see this decision um, in verses 14 through to 20. Let me read from verse 14. Uh, Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. Well, here's the first response, fear. Even though Jesus has shown himself to be magnificently powerful, full of compassion, the people are still afraid. Now, why might that be? Well, it's true that sometimes people prefer darkness over light. They prefer to stay within the realm of evil rather than come into the, the realm of, of righteousness that, that Jesus provides. Why is this? Well, for some people, darkness is attractive. Maybe they're invested in evil. Maybe they're profiting from it. They don't like the challenge and change represented by Jesus and his message. I wonder if this is a fear that some of us might harbour, then it's worth asking the question, do we really realise where it is that evil will take us? Remember, the purpose of this demonic influence, the, the purpose of evil is to lead us to death. Um, the scene I'm reminded of here is, is like a scene in one of those gangster films or mobster films. We've all seen them and there's always this scene where the gangster says to the, to the victim, why don't you come here with me and take a little ride? We know what's going to happen at the end of the ride, but often the victim has no idea and so they're, 
They're there in the car and then they pull up beside an abandoned factory and then the victim realises, this gangster want, wants to have my life. And so it is with, with evil. And we, we go along for a ride, we hop in the car, but we don't realise where that car is headed. And so we allow ourselves to be tempted, we, we allow ourselves to be led down a wrong path by, by, by evil doctrines. Uh, perhaps we might even literally welcome spiritual activity by, by dabbling with the occult, whatever it is. We ought to realise where this path, path leads. It, it leads to death. And so resisting Jesus, being afraid of Jesus is probably not a wise idea. And we ought to realise who wins in the end. Is resisting Jesus really a smart idea given his power in the face of of evil spirits. I don't think it is. We have another approach, though, another response in verse, from verse 18 onwards. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. He's experienced both sides, and he's decided whose side he's going to join. He wants to sign up. He begs to go with Jesus. But Jesus did not let him, verse 19, but said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you, and how, he, and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. So Jesus doesn't allow him to go with his band of disciples, but he does send him on mission. He deploys him with a message. Now, it's interesting. The Decapolis still had demonic activity going around. These demons wanted to stay there. They wanted to stay in the area. But how does Jesus do battle? Not by deploying an army of exorcists, but by deploying a preacher. Someone with a story to tell. Someone to tell others about who the Lord is and what it is that he can do for them. And it's interesting. Later on in Mark's Gospel, in Mark chapter 7, Jesus goes back to the Decapolis and people come and they ask him to do miracles. It seems as if this man had done his job and he'd prepared people well to welcome Jesus and to receive what it is that he had for them. My question for us is what is our particip participation going to be in this battle against evil? The participation is not to cast out demons, but the participation is to be like this man and to go out with a message, to participate in the ministry of the word of God. What's our participation in that going to be? What opportunities might we have to, to say something about the power of the Lord Jesus um, it doesn't have to be very much, but sometimes you've got to realise that the opportunity is there and the time is there to speak. I'll just finish this with this one example of me, my, one of my attempts to speak about the power of Jesus over evil. It was a few years ago during the height of the ISIS crisis in, in the Middle East. Do you remember seeing these terrible stories in our news feeds about what this so-called Islamic State was, was doing in that part of the world? I remember speaking to my neighbour at the time and uh, we both expressed just how horrified we were by what it is that we were seeing. And she said, what can we do about it? What can be done about this? And I thought to myself, well, here's an opportunity. And so I said, well, yeah, I, I think what I'm seeing on the TV and on, on the internet is evil. I think what I'm seeing is really evil. And she said, yes, yes, it is. What can be done? And I said, well, have you ever prayed the Lord's Prayer? And she goes, yes, when I was a child, I did. And I said, well, what is it that we pray in the Lord's Prayer? We pray, deliver us from evil. I said, I think that's the answer. Turn to God. That's the answer. And after I said that, she was kind of stunned into silence and didn't really speak much more about that. But I, I trust that the Holy Spirit used that in some way or that God would use that in the way he wants to use it. But friends, that is the answer. In the face of evil, pray to God and speak of God. That's the answer. Will you participate in the battle against evil by doing the same? I'll lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, forgive us our sins. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. Amen.